roll right in. So uh, here with Hunter Gathray, it's not very often that you get to have a father-son combo on the show, but uh, we're very fortunate that we have two great Gathrights. Uh, Hunter being the second one to come on. Many of you remember we had his dad on, uh, what was it, about a year ago, I think. Yeah. I um, so it's cool to have you on. Th- thanks for uh, thanks for making the time. It's going to be yeah, a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. So uh, right before we got started, we were talking about the go to mat and, and you're you're in the, uh, I, I don't remember the exact uh, seating position or seating okay. pose, but but you you go ahead and, and describe, you, you're, you're sitting down in a particular way so, that allows you to, to be healthier. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that I'm sitting is called the Seiza position. Uh, you've kind of seen this in multiple co- cultures throughout history. Uh, but basically what this is, is this is just kind of the full range of motion of the back, the legs, the kneecaps and everything. You know, most of us are stuck in a chair trying to never get past this position. So we lose that mobility back there. So this not only keeps us loose and limber while we're resting, but this back position here, you can see how my feet are resting. Well, that's what we call that inside ankle bone high position, which is basically just this landing position we're looking for in Goda, uh, upside down in a different position. So we try to rest into those good postures with that same inside ankle bone high technology to where when we get up and move around, that tissue set into a safe and secure place, and then we can go through space with that tissue set safely instead of being in a vulnerable position. So th- th- this will be up on YouTube for everybody watching or new to the show. Uh, we have it on YouTube, all the major podcast apps and so forth. But to, to just elaborate a little bit on if you're if someone's listening to this on their phone on Spotify and they don't have the, the visual. So you, you, you're sitting to basically where you, you where your knees are going forward and you're sitting back on your ankles, so to speak. Your rear end is back on your ankles, right? And your feet, yes. the, the ankles are, are angled outwards. So, yes, I've or, got my shins flat on the ground. I'm kind of sitting with my butt resting against my heels, and I've got those heels pointed away from me, away from the center line. And, and explain what the benefit of that is. I mean, I, a lot of people listen to Coach Gill. He, he's a very popular show uh, that we had Um and we talked about it a little bit, but if you would just kind of go into a little bit on why that's important that people sit like that. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of us throughout the day, like I said, we're stuck in a chair. We never really were driving around in cars. We don't ever really get that full range of motion in our knees. So when we start to lose that mobility in the back of the knees and start to lose that length in the back, we start to get everything compressed into the system. Our spine starts to get to compress. You see a lot of times in the chair, we're kind of resting on our thumbs with our hips mm-hmm. up like this. We lean back in that chair. We let our feet get out oops, there we go. Get out and pointed wide so that when we get up, well, now all of a sudden when I stand up, I'm more likely to get into what we call a, a forward front chain dominant position where the hips are pressed in front of the ribs. We get everything compressed. So when we're resting into that compressed position, We kind of maintain that when we go to move, whereas we like to get into more of a a safer and and more efficient resting posture that we can take through space and our joints can be decompressed. We're not really crammed down and everything's safe as we get up and move forward. Do do you see, and you're doing, so you obviously, you and we're going to get into it, you're pretty high level TPI, I believe you're three, uh, and and, and you have... um, Fit for power, I think, uh, as I was reading on you over the last couple of weeks and months. Level yeah. two, is that right? Yeah, uh, and then you have another one. What, what, what's the third level certification you have through them? Uh, just going back up to the, the lab at TPI and going through basically what we learned in the level two uh, modalities and everything online. They just kind of apply that more of an in-person weekend and then go forward from there. So you, you're, you do the, you help people with their physical training. And then you also help with their golf swing, given that, you know, you've been around your dad, obviously, your entire life, yeah, and he, I, I he's exceptional. Probably anybody <laughs> ever should have. <laughs> and you're a good player in your own right, right? Yeah. I think you won the San Antonio City Championship one year. I did. So, so you have a, a wide perspective on how to help somebody. Let's say somebody calls you up next week or they hear the show and they're in the Houston area, which is where you are now, and they call you up and say, hey, I've been having some physical problems. I'm not able to play as much. Um, I want you to check out my swing. You, you're able to do all those things. 
Absolutely. We can run you through a, a physical assessment that takes, it's about a minute and a half video that we run through it, everybody through uh, just doing some simple movements, um, standing posture. We do squat, we do hinge, we do single leg standing, and then we take them through just walk and a light jog. And then from there, I can kind of assess, you know, where any point in the body where we're kind of struggling, where we can improve and kind of get back to that decompressed state that we were talking about and get the joints moving properly and, and get them back to enjoying and moving better of playing golf. What, what are some of the, g- g- given as you touched on people sitting, be it at an office or they're driving quite a bit, uh, they're not as physically active as maybe they were a decade or two decades ago. What are some of the, the common denominator problems that you see with, with golfers or people in general? So I see a lot of people with their feet out, uh, whether it be when they're standing, when they're walking, uh, that causes a big problem just because as we go to move forward, if you can imagine, you know, the feet straight on railroad tracks, that's kind of the optimal position that we're looking for. You know, the foot lands straight, it gathers the energy and then kind of sends it forward and propels us forward through space. And when we start to get those feet pointed out, we start to kind of collapse everything into those insides of the feet which brings the knees in now. We don't quite get the proper rotation in the shin, the thigh, the foot platform's not sitting properly. So that starts to cause problems in the joints. It starts to cause wear and tear on the tissues, leads to a bunch of itises. And in my case, it was actually leading to a degenerative two disc in my back. So for for someone who's trying to picture this that that doesn't have maybe the... uh medical training, not, not medical meaning as a doctor, but a lot of golf pros understand through TPI and other modalities and disciplines. So feet, when you, when you mentioned feet on a railroad check, that would be the outside portions of the feet would be parallel, right? Yes. Outside portions. We like to think big toe or second toe pointed straight ahead. Okay. And, and, and when feet are pointed out that that would be what many would consider the, the classic duck or, or web footed positioning. Yeah. Which is yeah. funny because when you look at a duck walk, they uh, they actually walk pretty well. <laughs> right, <laughs> that that he 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 goes away exactly. All sorts of stuff. So when you we've we've broken down the duck, and you can actually kind of see they have similar technology to everybody else, kind of feet straight and bows and corners, as we like to say. <laughs> and, and it is in in my you know I've been fortunate enough to through coach Gill and, and just the, reading his material and watching a lot of the videos and stuff. And I told him before he was on, I, you know, I had found go to just randomly searching social media. I think it was mm-hmm. Instagram years ago. I'm like, this is some very interesting stuff. Yeah. And, and just the, the, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the soft tissue. So as the feet get compromised in any direction outside of what you guys have deemed as should be normal, if, if you can even use that word in today's society, that it's the downward pressure from the load bearing joints that really start to put pressure on the inner portion of the ankle. Right. And, and yeah. then the leg and it works itself up. Absolutely. So for those of us that are watching, we kind of see if I start to get this pointed out and when I go to land, well now because we're moving forward, everything more kind of wants to kick into this inside low position here. And then what happens is, is because we're loading all that in because gravity is taking us this way, when we go to move forward, everything wants to spin out in what we call reverse as we're moving forward. So you can imagine if we've got both feet pointed out, and for those not listening, if we've got one half of the body working in one direction and the other half of the body moving forward, you can imagine with every step the the deterioration that's happening, like the stress that's being put on the joints because the body's not loading in a decompressed manner. It's not taking that energy that it's loading with every step properly. It's not able to release it properly. And, and therefore it becomes a, a repetitive stress to the body over and over again. And if you're taking, you know, a lot of us are taking 10,000 to 20,000 steps a day sometimes, especially as golfers. And if you're taking every step moving against you, that kind of eventually over time, it's just bound to collapse and crash. It's almost like the body torques in the opposite way that it should be torquing yes, does that does that exactly. make sense yeah 100 percent. because there is a natural torque in in the bows in the uh, bows and flows do i have that one right i i'm not up bows to speed on 
but bo- yeah, bows and corners. So uh, on the on the in the go to system, the bows and corners that is like the the way that the body is supposed to be twisting and torquing as, as energy moves through it. And if I and, and and for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, go, you're more than welcome to hit pause right now and just Google go to and, and check out yeah. some of the videos. Yeah, uh, it, it's some very cool stuff. Um, but and you'll see what we're talking about where if somebody's walking in the in the classic web foot position and as brian just exp- I'm, uh i'm sorry as hunter just explained uh you're 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 so if if you step forward your right foot and you're web footed your right hip wants to move backwards in an opposite pattern that that go to says that you should going back to ind- indigenous people from the dawn of time absolutely we're just trying to get everything to flow from one side of the body to the other and catch energy optimally so for those watching, what we're talking about in that bow shape is when I go to land, I want to kind of let everything gather around this outside portion. And you'll see that kind of creates this bow shape in the leg. You see it kind of sends the back heel away a little bit. And then as we release, because we're gathering everything on the outside, we teach that to release around and in. And that heel goes away and catches in that safe bow on the other side. So the body's moving side to side on this little pressure wave back and forth safely through space as opposed to when it's going forward with those feet out everything's kind of collapsed into this position and wants to spin out the opposite direction so yeah that reverse pattern that we talk about is more of a load from in release to out we teach to load from the outside and release to the inside and t- did, did you start first with go to and then go and look at the, the- TPI information, or, or were you with TPI first and then went into the Godian? Uh, I was with TPI for probably about five years before, or maybe four years before I had found Goda. Um, I did TPI for a little bit and then started learning from a group called Weck Method, which uh, is David Weck. D- David Weck, yeah, familiar with his stuff. Yeah, and um, I, I liked that I got to, you know, in the, in the TPI world, we kind of get that core brace mentality where we got to kind of get this inside strong. And for me, the, the WEC method kind of allowed me to wiggle the spine a little bit more and train that spine to move a little better, which I feel like helps me a lot. But mm-hmm. because I was training the spine to move really well, but the rest of the system down below wasn't working in an optimal way, I was just basically just speeding up the process of deterioration, trying to, you know, I was doing a lot of weightlifting, doing a lot of stuff to try to build up, get stronger, hit the ball further, which I did, and then hit a plateau and kind of fell off. Um, And that's kind of when, you know, it was right when COVID hit. Funny, because I, uh, I, I was trying to find something new to learn because we were kind of stuck in the house. Um, I had heard previously about Goda kind of through Instagram, like you had, I had seen some stuff and, uh, the, the WEC method guys, I'd asked them about it because it was kind of the, the competition, uh, and they didn't really know much about it. So I wanted to go explore and I went over, did the, you know, the online course that we have for Goda, went over to the lab and, uh, Ricky Stanzi, who's the head of Goda mm-hmm. over there assessed me and was like, dude, if you don't stop competing right now, you're going to blow your back out again. And I was like, I mean, I'm sure he's probably, you know, he's probably right, but I think I can keep doing the exercises and still just keep competing and I'll be fine. And three weeks later, I took a step and my back was blown out again. So I went back over to them and was like, guys, what's this going to take? Like, how long do I need to take off now? I had to get injections again. Uh, And I started working with them, started feeling great dropped that last uh, back episode down to 112 mile an hour swing speed and clocked in last week at 126. So Ooh. that's uh, the ability to do that without lifting any weights for the past two years is, is incredible. I mean, and to do it pain free is even better. You know, I finished around the golf and my hips not like getting that achy feeling anymore. My mm-hmm. back's not tight or sore. Like I feel good. Like I can go keep doing other things. Uh, after I after I play around a round of golf, which is really the best thing, because feeling good is what you really want when you go do anything. What what was the, the, if you could go back a little bit to, to some of the comparisons of the training you were doing before that some contributed and 
large part to your injury and then some of the things that you're doing in the go to system that seem to have taken that that threat or that that uh, potential away absolutely so uh, one of the things that i was always told uh with my back pain was that i needed to get better at the deadlift so i was always trying to get better at doing the deadlift trying to get my hip hinge better do all that and uh you know go to teach us the complete opposite we don't pull any weight from the ground uh, we don't do any sort of power lifting or any anything like that. No heavy back squats. Uh, everything's more heavy repetition, body weight stuff, making sure that the position is correct and secure. That way, when we do go to do those explosive uh, activities like play golf, I'm going to revert the nervous system to be safe instead of revert to the deadlift or anything like that, which in golf, I think the deadlift is probably the worst exercise that we've ever given golfers because it's teaching, if we pull weight from the ground, it's teaching the hip thrust. And the one mm -hmm. thing that we want to avoid in golf is the hip thrust. So if I'm programming under heavy load to drive weight through the heels and thrust my hips forward, then golf's a, I'm swinging over 100 miles an hour. It's like it's heavy. So when I'm doing that, if I resort, resort to heels down, drive the hips forward, not only is it going to create bad golf swings, but it's going to hurt my back. It's going to hurt my hip. It's just not, it's not good for you. And, and so, so what, what were some of the, the things that, that Ricky put you on that to get you out of that patterning that was going to torque the shit out of your lower back, which is Absolutely. mostly, you know, if, if you're coming into to early extension, your hips are moving towards the ball and you're, trying to unwind simultaneously there there is some part of your back most people is going to have it in the lumbar spine Absolutely. The, the torque i mean there's a lot of torque in the golf swing to begin with but that's going to send the torque level to defcon 5 really quick especially yeah. at the speed you were swinging 120 plus yeah 100 percent. so kind of in that golf swing before we get on to the exercises so you can imagine if i'm used to driving in this way and then reversing this way mm -hmm. golf swing if i'm used to driving this way, reversing in this way, that's going to create that hip thrust. So if I'm doing that over and over again throughout the day, I train it into my lifting where I'm pulling up from here, I'm driving weight out, kind of spinning the energy in reverse. Well, now every movement that I've made throughout the day is in that hang back, early extension, hip thrust position that I've, I basically I've just become that position, you know? And then you can you start to get the inconsistencies on the driving range and on the course under pressure, and you're like, what is going on? And it's just something as simple as a, a bad pattern is going on. So what, what, were, yeah, what, what were some of the exercises that, that you're, you've done and that, and that you're doing now to, to allow you to swing at such high speeds again? Yeah, absolutely. So we do a lot of groundwork stuff. So you can tell, like, I'm, I've been in this position the whole time. It's, I'm not uncomfortable. I'd probably sit here for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but just starting off, you know, a lot of people can't even get onto this position right here to get the hands underneath the shoulders on all fours, get the heels away with the toes touching and the shins pressing into the ground, and just simply rock back. I mean, a lot of people are going to struggle with this position here, just getting back into, like, halfway back into the heels. So that's a start. So we just want to make sure we keep this chest up. We keep a little light arch in the back. And then as we go back, we try not to let that round back this way and just slowly gain access, keeping those shins pressed into the ground, keeping the outside of the foot pressed into the ground, and just rock back. And we do that to start. Then we'll start to take that rocker position, move it from column to column. So I'll take everything loaded into one side. You can see this is kind of that running position just in that all fours position. So we load into one side with our head over our kneecap. And then we just kind of transfer that from side to side just to learn how to do take that walking or that running behavior and just load from column to column. We tuck the toes underneath, do those same rocker positions to try to decompress the feet. And then from there, I mean, the other exercises really have been sitting against the wall, making sure those feet are straight. We get about a foot width, uh, a foot distance away from the wall. 
get those heels way up off the ground, and then we just kind of set into what we call this bow shape, where the knees point out, the shins are rotated out, the thighs are rotating. We keep that chest nice and low and then squeeze those scaps together. So this is our bow air chair. And then our corner air chair is where we're taking that energy from out. We're spinning it around to in. So we get those heels away, we get the butt high on the wall, and then we just sit and hold these positions or we kind of flow back and forth between the two. And that's really like, you know, a lot of people get bored with Goda because it's, it's really that simple as just training those patterns, getting the nervous system to be able to revert to that under pressure. And I mean, that's it. Go enjoy your sport. You know, the, the somewhat of the common consensus in, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the traditional golf training uh, industry is, is that the, the weight training strengthens the body and that it allows the governor of the subconscious to, to remove itself to a certain level because it feels the body is, is going to be safe and more stable, allowing it to swing at a higher speed. That seems yeah. to be somewhat of a general consensus, but um, in, in knowing some of the go-to material and in, in talking to you, with through through your routine and how you've changed that doesn't seem to be something agreeable yeah i mean we still build strong trust me uh if you see the a athletes that gary's pumping out of gls over in marrero i mean we're working with nfl linemen we're working with mlb mm -hmm. players nba players i mean these guys are athletes they're they're not by any means strong but or not strong but what i would ask everybody is what is strong you know, that's that's kind of where I would ask that question is like, what are we defining as strong? Because if I can pick up 300 pounds from the ground, but my swing speed's going down because of it, is that something that's making me stronger or is it making me weaker? So it just kind of like you have to ask yourself what the end goal is. If, if I'm trying to be an athlete that's a forward locomotive athlete, whether it be you know, football player, basketball player, somebody that's running, whether it be a locomotive swing athlete, like a baseball player, a throw athlete, like a, a baseball or quarterback, or a swing athlete, like a golfer. Those are all locomotive behaviors. So I would want to train my locomotive behavior to be what's strong and durable, not picking up 300 pounds from the ground, because especially as golfers, when am I going to do that? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what is really the most that I'm picking up? My, my bag that might weigh 50 pounds? Like, I'm never really picking up that much weight. So to train the nervous system to have to do that under heavy load and stress is kind of working against you. You would rather train yourself to be light on your feet and fast and efficient, not slow in the heels and driving everything through the ground, you know? Yeah, I've got one friend coming on. Uh, he's a trainer. He's a Paul Check guy from the Czech uh -huh. Institute. Uh, yep. And I've had Dan Hellman on, uh, you know, Dan through TPI, I'm sure. Uh -huh. um, and, it, we, and and the guy that the, the friend of mine, the other friend that's coming on, Justin Price, we, we've had a lot of conversations about that and deadlifts or squats, for example. And, and when we really started talking about that was when Rory was catching a lot of flack for for his deadlifting and gaining size. And obviously, yeah. Randall Chambly was very anti lifting weights and all those things. And and the thing that he told me was, you know, it. it whether you adhere to that philosophy or not, but he said, look, there's no reason for a golfer to do a 400 pound deadlift or a 300 and some pound deadlift. Yeah. If, if, if a golfer can do that, then he should be doing it in a certain time sequence that he's not losing speed in his golf swing, because if he's just sitting there and his body is firing as fast as it possibly can, well, that might build a neural response, but you're not going to build a, an adaptable response that's usable in your golf game. And you're likely going to hurt yourself at some point, which yeah. it seems like a lot of people are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, just in our camp alone, my dad had, I think eight college players, D one college players who when COVID hit, went to heavy lifting, you know, they got more time in the gym. Every one of them lost 48 miles an hour. Uh, and my mm -hmm. dad was just like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on? You're slow. And of course they answered, doing deadlifting, doing powerlifting. He said, I want you to just remove the deadlift. You can do everything else. Just take out the deadlift and see what it does. Every single one of them gained their speed back. 
Johnny Kiefer from Baylor gained his speed back plus an extra two miles an hour. Mm. So, and, you know, and I, things, I, just, just by getting rid of that one exercise in the gym. I've had um, Dr. Richard Geyer. I'm sure you know him being from Texas, right? The yeah. Texas back and so the, the famous surgeon. Yeah. And and I asked him, I said, Did, what is your opinion on uh, deadlift? In fact, I think your dad sent me the, the question because I, I put it out, you know, Dr. Richard Geyer, the famous surgeon is coming on the show. Does anybody have any questions they'd like me to ask? I think your dad was the one that said, ask him what his opinion is on deadlifts. And he said, I'm not a real big proponent of people strapping on hundreds of pounds be it on a squat, on their, meaning on their shoulders, on their back, compressing yeah. the disc down, or the deadlift, which is putting the disc in a very in the vertebrae in a very vulnerable position. Absolutely, it, at, at least at those weights, you know. Yeah, and that's what's funny is like we all know we we know that loading up the spine with a bunch of weight hurts you. Like moving companies will tell you, hey, nothing under fifty pounds, guys. Anything over that, we got to work together and take a team to do it. Like. Mm -hmm. They know because they have more insurance claims if somebody lifts up 50 pounds that more people are getting hurt. So the I think we kind of took the need for the proper movements that they were teaching in the gym, like the deadlift, like the squat. And social media <laughs> just kind of blew it up into this, like, who can do the most insane thing? Uh, and and from there, it just, you know, I, you got Rory that's lifting chains and doing deadlifts. You got Bryson that's, you know bulked up what 60 pounds or something like that yeah and, it, it looks like bryson's is is mostly with machines and through his yeah, diet where his nice calorie nice. consumption so yeah. it, it in theory i guess it would be a little more safe if it's on a machine where he's not having to stabilize and, and if, if it's going to go back he can kind of let it go you know he's not forcing his body to hold on to position yeah. so what i see in a lot of those guys that are building speed that fast like uh, Bryson, as you notice, he starts to get that big heel spin on the finish. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of that is just the, it's an inability of the ankle to catch how much speed is coming into there because the speed has been built up so fast and the ankle hasn't been built in a way that can handle all that torque. He mm -hmm. has to release into that heel in order for it not to just rip his kneecap apart. So it, it works, but in the long term, you know, how efficient is it or, you know, how sustainable is it? I don't know. We see him. He's already gotten hurt a couple times um, and come back, but hopefully. Uh... It, it's very interesting in that because I, I've seen s some of the anti GOTA stuff uh, because it, it comes from, well, players are that are playing a, a sport where they're swinging for the better players 100 plus miles an hour with a driver that they're going to injure themselves anyway or the propensity to injure themselves is very high. It is. But it, and so I, I guess with all the measurement technology we have today, it, it would be worth someone doing a study. I wouldn't be surprised if you're the one that did it because of your bridging the gap where you have the TPI and you have the go to background to where you, you could take two designated groups and say, okay, you guys are going to train go to for three years. Right. Yeah. We're going to take take these golfers, let, let's say through college level, because that seems to be I think that would be a fair age in category to, because they, they're now where they're gaining strength. They're now where they still have the mobility and flexibility of a kid, but they have the muscular development of a, an adult in the beginning levels. And, and you've got them for more or less four years. Mm -hmm. And you can say, OK, this group we're going to do go to only and this group we're going to do traditional. Yeah. And at the end of the four years, we're, we're going to see where everybody is and I, I guess that that would be a starting point or a genesis to, to really have a fair comparison and then yeah, the camps get together and say hey here's what we found out guys I think if we tweak this this way and maybe if we tweak this this way it would be beneficial to everybody yeah absolutely we definitely uh we, we're trying to get as many studies as we can you know a lot of ours is is the slow motion the video evidence you know we we'll always mm -hmm. go back to to the tape and in golf, that's where it was really easy for me to make the transition to go to is like, I've been looking at tape since we were dragging the box out onto the range to play <laughs> one loading the VHS into the VCR and sending people home with a tape. Like, so looking at the slow motion, like it, people always say, you know, if it, if it came down to a court of law, go to would, it would hold up. It, it, do, do you ever get the feeling be, be, that you're almost like a, uh, an outsider when you go to one camp because you're you're educated in the other camp like when when if you go to tpi do they kind of rib you or give you some shit 
because you do the go to uh, and then vice versa? The bear a few times uh, and ask some questions. And, you know, I kind of get like the the uh, one I've gotten is, you know, the average tour player thrusts the hips. It's like 20 degrees or something at impact or something. Mm -hmm. some, some stat like that. It's always comes down to a to an average. And that's one thing that I've always had a problem with with TPI is it's based off of averages. And you and I both know coming from sports backgrounds, I don't ever want to be average. My right. goal is to be great. I want to, I want to play this game forever. I want to feel good forever while I'm doing it. I want to be able to continue to get stronger. Like I, I don't want to have to, to, to back off any of that. So, sorry. Uh, so when we're basing that, uh, that law of averages, you know, that's going to include the people that are hurt too. It's going to include the guys that are slow, the guys that aren't moving as well, the guys that are locked up. So I don't ever want to be that average golfer. My goal is to train. What's the best guy doing? What's the guy that's been out there 40 years killing it doing? Mm -hmm. That doesn't have any injuries. I'd rather, I'd rather move like that guy than just whatever the average across the field of PGA Tour players is, you know? Uh, yeah, it, you, and I think that the, you know it, I've had Doctor Will Wu on and Doctor Scott Lynn and uh, talking to your dad and and a lot of different people. It, and it's that there's a couple things that I've noticed in doing the podcast over the years is that one is what we know now with the inordinate amount of ways to measure things, be it TrackMan or Flight Scope or Swing Catalyst or K Vest or all these different things, is that we we know that everybody is unique and different in their own way. Yeah. So you, you like it, the, the teaching and the coaching of the swing is a prime example. It's like, look at the LPGA, look at the PGA, all the different type of swings out there. And all of them are very successful. Or they wouldn't be where they are. Absolutely. So the, the next question in my mind comes, okay, if, if we're able to identify things in the swing, like, uh, like Mike Adams and Terry Rolls do with their biodynamics course um, mm -hmm. to, to determine how someone's going to grip a club, where their hands position should be based off their forearms and, and you know, how they're pivot, how they should pivot. Are they centered rear front? Pole? All those different things. It, that, that seems to be a step in identifying what a particular person should do. And it would be very interesting to, to figure out what a particular person should do as far as their training. Yeah. Right. And, instead of, as you said, t t t so many studies are taking averages. Yeah. Um, and I had John Dunnigan on uh, last week, um, and, and we were talking about the difference in, in scientific, quote, papers that some of them, the, the, the term scientific being used is an absolute travesty. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can, I can get you a, an article that, or a research study that says cigarettes are good. I can get you a research study that says cigarettes are bad. You know, mm -hmm. research study is always going to benefit whoever's paying for the research study, obviously. Um, yep. That's just kind of the way it goes in today's world. What um, the one, one of the the knocks as I follow uh, Coach Gill and, and Ricky and, and the go to things is that and, and this really came to light to me uh, after the, the guys were on the the Mark Bell podcast mm -hmm. and, and uh, what, what's the black guy on there? Uh, I, I don't know how to say it. N N Nazim. Yeah. Uh, so. so in, in one of the the post shows, he he was saying that. And this is, this is, I'm not saying Coach Gill and Ricky and these guys do this, but it's like some of the, the younger people getting trained and go to take a very anti position against anything. And it seems like that it's, it's either our way or the highway, very dogmatic. Yeah. And I, I know that, that the guy who has that functional patterns system. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the, yes. He, he, yeah. He, that, that, that's a very harsh rub that I see people not, not going to him. And I, I, I kind of seen his system from afar i'm not very familiar with it but it seems yeah. like a lot of people don't gravitate towards him because of his hey i'm better and these other systems suck it seems yeah. like there is a segment of go to that, that that has that and do you see that or do you see that changing at all i think in the beginning there was a lot of that um and in, in the beginning when gil first found all this stuff you know he got a lot of pushback he tried to go with gary and present this to universities and try to get you know really show people a new way of doing things and got shut out uh, countless times. And, you know, after a while he, he started poking the bear a little bit and started to get mm -hmm. some recognition. And I think in the beginning we had to kind of battle people and, and go through kind of that Instagram, you know, our way or the highway deadlifts or all powerlifting's horrible. Don't do any of that. 
just to sort of get people's attention. Um, and now everything's kind of shifted. Um, you know, GOAT has become a, a little less harsh as, as far as Instagram goes. Uh, we're, we're more just trying to push programs to people and get people out of pain. That's, that's our main focus. You know, we want to help the high school athlete that was, you know, me or Rick, that Rick, Rick was sitting there, you know, having the yips during games uh, when he was playing in the NFL. And couldn't, he was doing breath work and doing yoga and all sorts of, they had hundreds of books that he was reading, just trying to get the throw fixed and couldn't figure out why. And goes to Gil and is like, oh, well, you're just an inside, inside ankle bone, low front chain dominant reverse mover. And for somebody to just say that to you and then you'd be like, well, you see it on the tape and, and you think back to all the coaching you had that kind of led you there, you're just kind of like, well, why isn't this? Why isn't this the norm? Like, where did we go wrong? So we're trying to help that that young kid that isn't necessarily going to get that good information that might not be in the gym with somebody who's teaching a lift property, might just trying to be do it a deadlift just because his friends are doing it, and it's going to mm -hmm. end up blowing his back and not being able to do what he wants to do just because you know that was the the training that was what it was supposed to be done. So I do think in the beginning we we gave a little pushback. We, we tried to, to get people's attention. We tried to fight back. We tried to prove our point. And now the waters have kind of settled down. We've, I think we've shown enough video. We've released enough info. We've shown enough exercises and helped enough people. I think it's starting to just catch on. It's like, oh, these guys really do have something special. We might, might be worth taking a look at. Uh, and I, my dad says, you know, 10 years from now, he thinks this is going to be what people are training in, in D1 facilities. And, and mm -hmm. that's, I agree. I think this is where we're headed. It, it, it's kind of cool as I look backwards and, and connecting the dots is that and, and one thing that, that I, when I knew that, that Goda wasn't some just fly by the seat of the pants BS great ability to advertise on Instagram was uh, my dad had found Peter Goskew's work about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really, I, I guess the internet was, you know, obviously around, but I mean, it wasn't what it is today, right? There was no social mm -hmm. media. There was, and it, it was relatively hard. You're still finding things by books yeah, uh, and absolutely. just reading and, and articles and talking to people. And he had found it and showed it to me. So when I found out coach Gill was a big Peter Goskew, or that's kind of where he got his start. I'm like, okay, if he was in that program, that then he's, he's legit. Yeah. This isn't some bullshit. Yeah. He, uh, so he was his mentor for a long time. And, uh, you know, Gil was able to get out of pain, get to start playing golf again, but it just wasn't quite, you know, he'd go to move a whole lot and he'd still have some aches and pains and he'd have to go through the corrective exercise to get restructured. And uh, he was just looking for something more. So Gil started analyzing tape with a, you know, a video camera up to the TV, watching Michael Jordan play. And then when YouTube came out and you could start searching indigenous tribes and all these videos on baby development, you know, he kind of broadened his eye to start looking at more. And one day he was watching Michael just land to the ground and he, he zoomed in on his knee and saw when he went to land, he came up, landed this way and his knee went click, 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 and then released the other way. And, and Gil was like, all right, I'm going to go film myself running. I'm going to see if I look like that. And he saw his knee go, you know, this way and then go click, click, click when he went to walk <laughs> through the opposite direction and he was like oh my god that's it like that's it that is the pattern and started to notice it across these cultures and in animals and throughout nature and and really started to see the pattern and that's when he kind of reverse engineered this program off how what is the safest way to get the body not only decompressed and feeling better like peter goskew had gotten him but how to retain that and keep it going when we move through space. And, and I mean, what he was able to do is incredible. Do, do you, I, I have been introduced to a lot of different things as far as training is concerned. Obviously the traditional were 20 some years ago when I had some back issues that, you know, they did the core stability and, you know, I, I, where I, could, I was doing my workouts where I could kneel on the ball and do curls and shoulder press. And I'm like, and then I'd still get hurt and I'm like, okay, this, this isn't working. There's something not here. Yeah. Um, Obviously, through Dan Hellman, I, you know, I was introduced to Eldoa and, and the Czech system, um, the Agoski stuff through my dad, and then learning the, the Goda, and then even the, the uh, 
foundation training with uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Eric Goodman and Jesse, and, and they've been on the show. Um, I, I do see somewhat of, of there, there are, it, it, when you get to the very high level people that are teaching this, you do start to see some similar patterns of, of corrective exercises from one discipline to another. Yeah, absolutely. And, and th- I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, definitely. Do you, do you see the same? Is, I mean, that you, you're, that's more your field. It's kind of a hobby of mine. Yeah, uh, there the are training the, aspect. In the correctives world, there's definitely a lot of similarities into, you know, they all kind of learned off the same models. So they're kind of geared towards structuring the exercises the same. So I do, I do see a lot of the same stuff when it comes in the correctives world. Um, I, I don't see as much like focus on when it comes to movement forward. I see a lot of correctives being like, isolation stuff mm-hmm. you know what i mean like let's let's get this muscle loose let's get this working back together it's not really taking the system as a whole and building it into a better forward moving system which seems to be in many respects a better way to do it because if you if, let's say a muscle spasmed or a muscle's tight and the soft tissue around it is the same once you get that released it's not just going to the rest of the body's not just going to say okay we'll go back to our normal position it's yeah, like there, there is right there's a residual effect throughout the entire body i i remember um when my girlfriend broke her wrist and she was playing tennis and she fell and she broke her wrist and then i told her because i had the theory or the understanding of this going back then and, and that was about 10 years ago i said you better go and get some work done to the upper part of your forearm and close to your elbow because those muscles lock down maybe not as much as anything around your wrist to mobilize, but it's going to, to, to tighten up and it's going to go up. So go get your rest of your arm work done, and that will help the rehabilitation of your wrist when you go to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, a, a whole integrated system seems to make a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah, if, if, you know, if something's messed up, something else is going to have to work harder in the body to make up for it. So it's just one thing turns off, one thing turns on too much, and then we have a problem somewhere. So with Goto, we're just trying to get everything firing on all cylinders together so that when we do have to feel that, like with when you start to get Goto and you get a fully decompressed system like that, you're not mm-hmm. stretching. There's not really anything that's getting tight. You're moving well you're kind of flowing through space. Like there's nothing working against you to get tight. So unless you're, you know, doing hard work outside or running hard, like that's going to be what gets you sore. It's not going to be just, you know, sitting around doing nothing. Where it's- <laughs> <laughs> what, um, go to talks a lot about the, the, the movement patterns being, uh, continual or, um, uh, what, what's the, the word I'm looking for, the uh, spiraling and, yes. and, 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 st- and staying largely away from linear, linear meaning like a bench press or a, a, a row, a curl, th- th- things of that nature. So can, can you just talk about that a little bit and the differences Definitely. and the benefits? So we, we first teach that this foot is, it's the platform to the ground. Obviously, however I land is going to affect everything up the chain. So we try to land with the foot straight. We like to get the, the whole pad is still on the ground. The toes are a little gripped, but we like to gather everything to where the inside ankle bone here. So you can see, if, for those of us that aren't watching on the video, if you look at your end, if you look at your ankles, you got one bone on the inside and one bone on the outside. We like to sit that inside one higher than that outside one. And what that does is that kind of sets the foot up into this platform that allows the shin to turn and wiggle, it kind of frees it up. Whereas if I put everything into this collapsed form into the inside, when I go to rotate, it's gonna lock down the shin and it's gonna affect everything up the chain, like we said. So if my shin can't rotate, my thigh can't rotate, I can't get into my hip, nothing's quite working the way that it should. So by setting this foot up in this proper platform, well, now I'm able to get the access to kind of spiral this energy to the outside of the foot kind of down, down, back and out towards this back area and then release it forward, back and in and around over to the front leg. And how does, as far as like, like uh, golfers tend to have, for a right-handed golfer, that the, there seems to be issues with the left wrist, the elbow and or the shoulder. What, what type of work do, do you guys do to, 
to help eliminate any let, let's let's take the shoulder for example let's take yeah. one there that that seems to be prevalent w what type of exercise or or things do you do to to help eliminate that so it doesn't come on or if it does how do you get rid of it so for shoulder stuff we have exercises we do a lot of band work we just make sure when we do it that i'm staying either you know into this sazer position where i've got my my ribs in front of my hips I'm not sitting with my rib, my hips in front of my ribs or straight up in front of me. I'm kind of working that long decompressed system with my hips back. Mm -hmm. And then we'll work this band work, you know, over and back. We'll do elbow curls and flies and shoulder circles to get the shoulders mobile. And then really, you know, what my dad and I have found with people that are struggling with a little wrist pain in golf and a little elbow pain in golf on that lead side is usually it's a weak arm structure. Uh, and it just kind of doesn't allow the, the arm to rotate the way that it should. So just like the legs are supposed to gather and release energy a, a certain way, the arms are supposed to do it a certain way as well. So what we notice in a lot of golfers is if I start to get this grip to where this arm structure sits more underneath us, mm -hmm. that grip sits in more of a weak position on that lead side, well, that arm is going to want to swing more on an out to in and across pattern. So what happens is it doesn't match the pivot. As you go through, it wants to rotate away from you, and the arm wants to tend to get away from you. So what happens is, is that's just kind of that repetitive stress on the elbow, the wrist, uh, and ends up just causing like an itis. So we, we clean it up a lot with just fixing that arm structure and getting everything a little stronger, getting everything what we call pre-bowed over to that backside, kind of mm -hmm. a preset to where when we turn back and we go to pivot through, that, that arm stays with the chest and matches the pivot and is able to release properly. Is there, in the, as the go-to system is based off of primitive movement, is there a, a bowing and a cornering if somebody got on all fours that work with the arm and the shoulder structure oh, as yeah. well? There is. So when we sit in this, when we when we rock back, we kind of think about that load that we're creating as we rock back into that rocker. Well, that inside wrist bone is going to do the same thing that that inside ankle bone is going to do. So we're going to put the first finger or the second finger straight. Then as we rock back, we can kind of gather everything around internal like this, like we're loading everything in. And then as mm -hmm. we walk forward, we can send everything forward and around the corner and actually get some shoulder work in the groundwork that we're doing. So it all okay. just kind of works the same way. You know, if you look at the foot here, if I, uh, if I go to load everything on the outside, well, everything's going to kind of work to gather everything in, just like if I was going to throw something, if I was going to swing something down low, it's all going to gather energy to that backside and then want to release it forward. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of, we, we just teach that in everything we do. We program that nervous system to want to gather that energy around the outside or release it around to the inside. What do you do? So, somebody comes to you and they, they've been repetitive in their motion. We'll, we'll, we'll take the movement, repetitive mo movement being the golf swing. And now they have a lot of, uh, I don't want to use asymmetry because the golf swing isn't a, you know, you golfer, someone who, who's playing, let's say they play for a living or they're retired and they're playing three, four days a week. They're obviously going to have an asymmetry in their body because they're using one side so much. But l let's say just through, they sat at a desk for 25 years or they're sitting at a desk now, you know, five, six days a week and, and they're right. And they're tight and, and they're, they're tight from their daily activity. And then they get into playing golf and now they're developing asymmetrical tightness just from the movement that they're doing it, it do the movements that we've discussed to help set the body structure back into position that allows those um tight tissues to, to start to relax as, as yes. everything the load bearing things Absolutely. start to work in better order yes definitely uh it kind of it decompresses the system evenly you know we're kind of designed with one half of the body being more dominant than the other half of the body you know we teach at GOTA that you should be more back chain dominant than front chain dominant. Well, mm -hmm. when it comes to your swing and your throw and, and anything that you're doing, you're going to be dominant on one side. You know, we, we're not sitting there writing with both hands. We're sitting there. Most of us are either right-handed or we're left-handed in something. So 
typically there's always going to be a little bit of asymmetry in the body because of the way we carry ourselves. We tend to dominate with the side that we're good at. Um, but the go to work definitely because we're decompressing the system, because everything, all the joints are getting decompressed to the max, we're able to reset everything back in alignment, uh, which is, you know, that's kind of what we focus on first is getting everything back into what we call our columns. So we like to see the shoulders, the hips, the knees, and the ankles all stacked on top of each other, uh, whether that be in your standing posture, whether it be a squat, a hinge. We like to see columns, so shoulders, hips, knees, ankles all stacked on top of each other. Yeah, it's been very fun. I mean, I, I told Coach Gill, and I, I messaged him from time to time, I said, you know, from so many years of playing golf and my right side being my trail side, that that my ankle rolling inwards and my right knee rolling, kick, kicking in, or let's say breaking down and it not being a column anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and after I was able to get my outside of the feet parallel and start walking more in a column, instead of my feet being so wide, I could feel the, the structure of my right leg working all the way up into the hip. Cause my, my issue was in the, in the lumbar spine, of course, playing golf. Yeah. And, and, and I, I have noticed that, that, that has slowly provided some structure um, to, to uh, at least allow some of the other work that, that I've done. And he, he sent me a basic program that I, I do. Um, Eric Goodman, you know, he, through their 12 minute exercise, I, I've got to get on their app. I've been talking to Jesse Solace about using their app. And then some of the Aldoa work that, that Dan had given me from Guy Voye, uh, a lot of those things have, have gotten me back to where I'm, I can play twice a week now. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, a, I don't ever have the expectation to hit 500 some balls a day. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was stupid when I did it looking back. Right. That's, and even Hal Sutton, I, I heard Hal on, on one of his podcasts say if, if he could have done anything else in his career that, that he thought would have had a major impact, he said he would have hit, done a lot more mirror or slow motion work yeah. and hit way less balls that's just from the wear and tear. That's do a lot of is that, that slow motion mirror work. That's, uh, Owning static positions, you know, I, especially that when we can feed these guys that, you know, when you do the go to work, this is what it looks like compared to the golf swing and they see that it's the same technology. It kind of makes them want to do that exercise. And then all of a sudden they don't have to go hit 500 balls. Mm -hmm. They can do an hour work of go to get in four or 500 good reps of good quality movement. And it's just like going to hit a, a full bucket, you know, full teaching basket of range balls. You know, one thing I've been playing with, um, because the, maybe, maybe you can shed some light on, is if when the outsides of the feet are parallel, it, it allows the, the, the pelvis to move in between, or, or I might get my anatomy wrong. So anyone out there that's listening and you're going to comment on social media, knock yourself out because I'm not a trainer. I'm not a doctor. I don't even play on the internet. I just happen to be, like I said before, it's been a hobby of mine for 20 years, but let, let, as the pelvis works between the, the, the legs, as it, as it moves backwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the feet are parallel at the outside portions, that becomes much easier as the femurs become internally rotated. Is that, do I have that yeah, right? Yeah, it becomes easier if you to work that ball and socket of the hip. Basically. Yes. So yet, yet most golf instruction will teach the feet to be flared outwards because that it allows was... the rotation of the hips. So you, you gain in that you can, some people who don't have the mobility and flexibility can rotate their hips better because the feet are flared outwards. Yeah. Yet it doesn't allow the pelvis to move back between the legs on the downswing. Yeah, it doesn't let you get back to the ball very well. Though. Yeah, so it's like a catch-22. Yeah, I, so that's funny because the, the first time I ever brought Goda to my dad, because, uh, I, you know, I like to be in there as a fitness guy teaching his, his better athletes. Uh, and he brought in a high handicapper who had been struggling with over the top for a long time. And to get him to turn better into his backswing, he looked at him and told him to turn his foot out. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my dad and I was like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to do this guy. <laughs> and he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, just straighten up his back foot. This is how the foot works. Straighten up his back foot. He'll be all right. And he got the guy to stop coming over the top. He'd been working on it for like a year and a half. The guy comes back and it's like, not only am I, am I hitting it better, but I feel good after I get done playing. I'm not hurting as much. Like, what did you guys do to me? And it's just, just by feeding those go to principles into the golf swing. I mean, we were able to clean up so many things. I remember when I played, I played really well when I was about 19 and I used to have my feet perfectly straight, maybe even turned in where the outside edges were more parallel. Yeah. And then after I moved to Hilton head and of course saying you're, 
at least I was exposed to a lot more top level instruction per se. Uh, and everyone's like, well, you got to flare your feet out. And it's like, you know, that I, I, looking back, I started, it, it, it wasn't right away. It took, you know, nine months to a year or so, but I, you could see that the tweaks that it started to cause some irritation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's where it kind of like, you know, go to fairly new. So I think when we're hammering away at these guys that like deadlift span, to them, it's become more personal. Like a lot of them have dedicated their whole lives to being in the gym like that and lifting weights. So, you know, they've had hundreds of people come through the gym that they've had do weightlifting programs and some of them haven't got hurt. Some of them might have would, you know, but to them, it's, it's like a personal thing. Like they're attached to these lifts and don't want to give them up. Mm -hmm. We're just saying like, Hey guys, there's a better way to train. This is, this is what's happening when you do these lifts. It's causing your, your nervous system to do some bad things. It's not really feeding to what you're trying to do. Here's a better way to do it. And, I mean, some people don't like that. Some people don't like change. I, you know, I, I, I did deadlifts, and, and I, I, when I heard, when your, I think your dad told me, or, or Coach Gill told me, when you had hurt your disc a few years back and uh, doing deadlifts, and I, I, that, I hurt mine twice doing that. One was just stupid. I had not been in the gym for a while, and I'm like, oh, you can push to get back to the weight you did a month yeah. ago. Um, well, no, no to the gate. You know, my dad has been teaching. Mm -hmm. Never noticed career was ended with a deadlift. He was in the gym doing his weight, regular weightlifting program, got a bar that was too heavy for him to handle, and blew out two discs in his back. Uh, and just was never quite the same after that. And what's great is we were able to introduce Goda to Noda and Chris Como a couple of years ago with, with Gil and Ricky. Mm -hmm. And uh, Noda kind of took from it when we were giving, his, uh, giving him all the info, we were all, you know, sitting around like this. And he tried to get into that position and could only get, you know, halfway down. And Noda being the guy that he is, took that one piece from that discussion and was like, oh, well, until I can do this, there's, like, I don't need to do anything else. And he went back home, did 400 rockers a day. Every day. <laughs> I didn't hear from him for six months. He just did 400 rockers a day every day. And he called me back and he was like, Hunter, my knees and my back and my hips are feeling better than they've ever felt doing this. I'm it, it, is that when when George Goyich was down there and yeah, your sure dad? I, yeah, because I... George and our, George and family and our family go way way back, like generations in okay. Chicago. Well, like I'm sure off. He told you we were at dinner and he, he George was sitting there and was like, "Y'all ever see this in any animals?" And Ricky pulls up his iPad and he says, "What kind of animal you want to see?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, George said I think it was uh, in his show, or I talked to him afterwards when um, when your dad was going to come on because I said, I, "You know, t tell me a little bit about Brian." Um, and he, he was saying that, that they, you guys had gone over to Chris's house and Noda was there and you guys were showing him this. And, and George said, yeah, that, that stuff is legit because, uh, you know, he, he wanted to do it as, as he's aging now and starting to feel yeah. the effects on his body. Absolutely. So it, it's kind of interesting. It, it's like, you know, let's talk before about connecting dots. You know, George led me to your dad and, and then obviously your dad connected me to you. Chris was I, – I, I, do not envy Chris Como at all. I mean, he's got a great life for his coaching, but he is all over the world. I mean, he he's, I've been trying to get him to come on the show and he's like, as soon as I get a break, I'm like, yeah, dude, good luck. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, you, you tell me and I, I can make it happen in an hour. Cause I, I'm not going to press him. I think he's great. Uh, I'd love yeah. to have him on just to talk about all the cool shit he does, but yeah, it, 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 it is cool. And then the foundation training and coach, yeah, I mean, it's been fun learning all these things and how it all ties together. Well, and what I was going to say about Noda was, uh, so in the, a couple months ago, he actually went back and was having some lessons with my dad because he still works with him, tries to get keep his swing together. And uh, he's got some exemptions on the senior tour next year. He's going to play again. And was Nice. Like, I got to thank you guys. You, you saved my knee. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. So it's definitely, it, I know we butted some heads in the in the industry but it's it's helping a lot of people find some answers to things that they never would have been able to fix otherwise are those the bolt rockers that that he was doing 400 a day he was just doing simple just shins down to the ground outsides of the feet uh, heels away and outsides of the feet press into the ground and just rocking back like this back and forth trying to get access to where he could sit like this comfortably and once that's he awesome here and could sit comfortably he was like 
ready to take the next step. Yeah, he, he's going to come on. I think your dad reached out to him on my behalf, and I think he noticed that after the President's Cup because he was doing some work for, yeah. for TV, and that, that, that'll be a fun one to talk to because yeah, he's uh, a great guy. Uh, Conrad Ray is a friend of mine. Conrad lived here in Hilton Head for about 10 years, and he's obviously the coach at Stanford. And Conrad said, you got to get Noda on at some point. And I said, okay, yeah. well, help me out. I, I can't just call up Noda. He has no idea who I am. We, we have a lot of mutual friends, but he's going to say, who the hell is this guy? Because back then the podcast, Conrad was, I think, my second or third guest. I was like, if I reach out to Noda, he's going to say, yeah, th thanks, but no thanks. I have no idea who you are. He's a great guy. He's, he, he know exactly who you're talking about. Cool. Um, I want to talk about you. You have a product, uh, as we talked before. You 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 do long drive, and you're, I think you're still doing it, if, if I'm not well, mistaken. I, I, I I'm more teaching now. I don't really play as much as I used to. But but, but you, you 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 got very high in the long drive, and, and you developed. I, I, I swing fast. I haven't competed in any long drive or anything, but I'm still okay. my swing speed still up to one twenty six, one point seven. And, and you developed a product called True Speed. Can, can you can you speak to what that is and and kind of where, where the genesis from that came from? So Derek Lobica and I, which is the, it's my business partner out of San Antonio, um, we were actually attending a TPI certification. Uh, I think it was the level three, uh, and they were showing uh, super speed, you know, how to build over speed training in golf, what to do with golfers. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what super speed is, it's the, the weighted sticks with the weights on the end of them uh, that are over speed training, which is basically over speed training is swinging at faster than normal speeds uh, with a lighter uh, or lighter weight and heavier weight to try to build speed uh, in your golf swings. So you basically swing, you know, certain way with a light, certain way with a medium, certain way with a heavy and, and try to build speed throughout time. Uh, and we were using the super speed sticks and it was funny because Derek, they have you swing left handed and Derek's right handed and he got up to make this left handed swing and it was, I still have the video. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and we were like, there's no way that the average golfer could pick this up and build speed. If anything, they might actually hurt themselves trying mm -hmm. to do this. So we kind of tried to come up with a better way. And what we came up with was this shaft here that has a flexible tip at the end. So it's a pliable tip that's attached to a clip and a weighted ball. The overspeed training is something that we still believe in. I mean, that's a, a proven method over time. They use that in sprinting. Uh, Tom House uses it in baseball, so they use it in the TPI mm -hmm. protocols. So we kept that overspeed training method and created a way to feel feedback throughout the swing. So when I go to take this back, where most amateurs will fight when they try to swing something really fast, get over the top and get really handsy with it, this ball allows you to shallow out the club and kind of feel some feedback in the swing so that you know, if I throw this over the swing, it's going to cast like a fishing pole. Whereas if I shallow it down, you're going to feel that smooth release. It's going to help you release the club better, teach you how to lag the club, teach you how to shallow it out, give you good tempo. So it's kind of an all around training aid uh, that's just a little bit safer and more efficient as far as training speed. Uh, and we got our patent back on, oh, it's been about since February of last year since we got our patent. How, how's it been going? It's been going great. We've actually, uh, we've got a purchase order from uh, golftrainingaids.com that's coming up. So we're going to be pushing heavy on golftrainingaids.com. Um, we've got probably five or six tour players that have ordered them and use them, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, one testimonial, uh, Jimmy Walker was able to gain three and a half miles an hour over the course of three months doing the training wow. uh, during the off season, which for him, that for tour players, that's the difference between, you know, carrying a bunker and not carrying a bunker out. Yeah, that, that's what, on average, it's two to two and a half yards per mile an hour. So that's, that's uh, what is that? Yeah, that, that's for him, eight to nine yards. Yeah, yeah so carry the ball nine yards further is, you know, that's a, a pitching wedge in instead of a not carry, having to lay up and hit a seven iron, you know, mm -hmm. that's uh so it's, it, we've had a lot of great success with it. We've got a lot of college uh, men and women that use it. Uh, Cam carry on out of UTSA was, I think she's picked up like eight and a half miles an hour over the last year. And she's maybe five foot, maybe, a mm -hmm. pounds, but I mean, out there crushing D1 golf, keeping up with all the all the girls hitting it past mode. She hit one 
across the other end of Cordillera in the bay the other day. Uh, wow. So that's, I mean, 300 yards for a five foot nothing girl is incredible. That's amazing. Yeah, some of the longest hitters <clears throat> I know, I've got a friend that was in the Super Seniors long drive uh, when uh, Tim, I think Tim Burke, the first year Tim won the long drive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mike was in the Super Seniors. And that was when Sedlowski was still competing yeah. regularly. And and everyone was amazed at how far Jamie hit it at, at the size he was. What was he, 6'1", yeah. 170 pounds or 180 yeah. pounds? Pound longest hitter ever, for sure. <clears throat> right. Well, uh, my buddy Mike Obarski uh, at, in the Super Seniors, he's 100, what was he, 148 pounds, and he hit one 376. And I think he, That's I think he got Jamie by like a tenth of a yard for the longest pound for pound in the world. That's incredible. Which is incredible. And it's like, how do these smaller guys generate so much speed? And, and Mike and I talked about it a lot. And, and he, he's, he was the first one to tell me, you can lift all the heavyweights you want. And, you know, years ago, it, it, it'll help to some extent, but it's, it's speed. It's not force production. Force yeah. does not equal speed. Exactly. Yeah. You and, know. And, and I bring that up because your, your device, as you mentioned, the first thing people do is they want to apply force to it and then they're coming over the top. Exactly. And it forces you to swing efficiently, which is going to get them more speed. Definitely. And it's going to translate to more speed on, on the golf course. You know, you might get more speed with the super speed sticks, but if I get five miles an hour faster and lose 12 golf balls on the course, <laughs> I'm not really that much happier about the five miles an hour. You know, I'd gladly give that back up to keep my golf ball in play. So this just allows you to train something that's actually kind of like a golf club, feels like a golf club, gives you that lag, gives you that that feedback, enables you to train something that's going to translate over to the golf course. Do, do you guys have a website strictly for the product, or is it through y'all's website for the golf schools? We do. It's, it's uh, truespeedgolf.com. It's T-R-U-S-P-E-E-D golf.com. And as usual, everybody, they all, all the listeners and subscribers know I'll have a direct link to that in the summary that – with all your other info and, and websites and social media and, and one click link that to get your five to 10 to maybe even 15 miles an hour faster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll put a, a coupon code in there for you too. When we put that out there. Cool. What uh, you, you do have one thing that I thought was very cool is the PMF electron is electron plus. Yep. So we have a, another go to coach located at our facility here in Sugarland named Arthur Robinson, who's a, a, a 20 year athletic trainer. I actually met him in the WEC method world and I went out to WEC method and came back and he had showed me this uh, electrons plus PEMF machine. Uh, and the first thing I said was dad, if we ever get out to the Houston area, we got to hire this guy. And mm -hmm. uh, sure enough, we opened a place where he was located. Uh, he was at the course right up the road. So he came over and basically what the machine is, is uh, he describes it like, like you would charge your phone. Uh, similar how you would plug it into the wall. He plugs this machine in, the electrical current comes through his arms, and he's able to charge you up. So he's able to basically transmit this electrical current through his hands while he does the massage to get muscles reactivated, get things firing properly. And then after he does that, he takes you through the go-to movements. So now not only is everything firing properly, but now we can get you moving properly and kind of speed up that recode process to getting everything set back correctly. I, I thought the recode was a great word to use for all that because it's really reprogramming the neurological system. It is. Uh, to, so, to, to mo movement patterns. And for anybody, uh, I'm not going to get into it now, but it's kind of like, you know, it, it, I, I explain it to people when I'm teaching them is like, as they're trying to change their swing pattern, let's say. And it's like a clock. You know, if you took the hands of a clock, they go from 12 to 1 to 2 and, and clockwise around the clock. I said, it, where, where you are now is you, your hands on the clock are going from, say, 12 to 4 to 1 to 7 to 3. I mean, they're, they're, so th there's a pattern that we have to re-implement. And if yeah. we move your swing in a way that, that is designed towards how you move, then that pattern is going to fall into place much better and be much more repeatable. Absolutely. Um. That's some very cool stuff. You guys got some groundbreaking stuff going on. We do. It's exciting. We're uh, we're definitely making some moves in the industry. We've got a, uh, a PGA seminar coming up in November uh, that we're presenting. We've got uh, a presentation we're doing with the Baylor golf team uh, and their athletic training staff. So we're trying. We're starting to make some moves. Starting to get in the right places and and 
you know, people are kind of like, hey, you guys are right. You know, when you when you look at the tape, when you show the training, when you when you show the like just look in the NFL alone, the increase in injuries is through the roof. I mean, just this weekend we had five or six people go out with something and mm -hmm. uh, you gotta ask yourself why. Uh, it's not like the like the training, we haven't been trying to get more geared towards better training, making sure people are moving white right in the weight room. We've got all these recovery modalities like your cryo, your your boots, the compression boots, you know, you got all. This uh, yeah, the, the Nor Normatex. Exactly. And people are still getting hurt at an astronomical rate. It's the increase is still going up and kids are getting hurt younger and younger. And you got to ask yourself, well, what's happening? Well, like, why? Why is this happening? And the only thing I can think of is the training room, the heavy weightlifting has gotten more serious. We've implemented it a little earlier into the environment. So now, you know, you've got some middle schools that are starting to do lifting. You're starting to be pressured into lifting earlier in high school. And now that growing body that's supposed to be growing and decompressing out and forming into these good movements before it's done growing, before the nervous system is set properly, it's starting to have to take on these bad shapes and these bad behaviors. So it doesn't really get the chance to fully get to a safe place. And those are the guys you start to see get hurt sooner. Is it because as you look at someone like a Michael Jordan, who, whose legs, he almost has a, a, a bowing to his legs naturally. So yeah. it, it, and then if you took someone, oh, I, I can't think off the top of my head, it would be a good example, but where they're almost knock kneed. So, so they're, they're in a woda pattern and, Mike, Michael Jordan's in a go-to pattern. It, yeah. Is there something throughout their life that, that allowed Jordan to develop that? or And is it something that inhibited the other person? Because so Jordan, if you, right, like you, you have different anatomical room. builds. Yeah, so Jordan stayed out of the weight room for a very long time. Uh, it wasn't until, I think, the Pistons that he started doing any sort of mm -hmm. weight training. Uh, and... Uh, he, you know, Jordan really, really never got hurt. He had his navicular problem that he had early in his career. Uh, but he was a guy that never really lifted weights, moved really well. You look at, like, your your Randy Moss and your Ed Reeds. Like, your, your Randy Moss used to say, cheated on stretch. You know, like he, he, didn't, he didn't do any sort of, like, crazy weight training. He wasn't doing anything like that. Like, these guys are they're good movers. If you keep moving well and you're building weight and, a, and you're moving well, then you're more likely to, to keep it for longer. You know, they try to, if they're avoiding the weight room, if they're, you know, Michael, what would, what was Michael doing? Michael would go out and play basketball. He'd play baseball. He'd go out and play golf. He's constantly moving and walking, keeping that tissue hot. And then he was in a safe, secure position. So he just kind of held on to that safety for throughout his career. The so would you say somebody who, let's say by the time they get to a trainer like you, if they're in their late teens or twenties, as they get to late high school or college age or even in, in an adulthood, and and they have a woda pattern, is is some of that just through life might have thrown them off somewhere and they didn't develop correctly? It or, could have. Um, it, a lot of times you'll see like in the developmental pattern, you'll see a lot of W sit, which we know is bad. So if I sit down into this position, we know that's bad. Um, so if you see kids doing any sort of crawling or anything like that, that's already starting to feed that behavior. But coming out of the womb, usually we're, you know, we're inside ankle bone high. We're in this fetal position. Mm -hmm. You kind of come out with this inside ankle bone, eyes, feet, straight setting. And then from there, all we can do is mess it up, really. Um, you'll start to see like babies that are thrown into shoes too soon where they can't get that wide foot development on the ground. They never really own that connection. So they start to lose that behavior a little bit with the mm -hmm. shape of the foot. You'll see when parents, uh, like not to say that parents shouldn't hold their kids' hands when they're walking, but when they start to hold their hands a lot, well, that cuts off a lot of the chest rotation and upper body rotation in the upper body. So a lot of times what you'll start to see is hand hold up here. This leg's really good. This one will kind of hang back behind. So they'll develop one side that's a little wonky. Makes uh, sense. A lot, of, a lot of time in chairs as a kid instead of kind of, you know, we, we believe one, we really hope one day to see all kids sitting in floor desks. Uh, being able to get back to the ground and own these ancient positions and 
and just be able to rest in a more natural way. Whereas this chair is really just taken away from that good movement that they have, you know, and especially with phones and stuff and everything's on a tablet or a screen in front of you. Like we start to get this rounded neck posture, everything kind of feeds into this front position when we get into that chair, whereas life is more elbows back, butt back, drive forward. Right. Yeah, I, I see that as you look at the international team of the President's Cup last week, uh, and there were a lot more Korean guys on that team, and obviously the Korean women have been doing some very impressive things on that tour for quite some time. And if you look at the training that they go through, uh, and I think Brandel Chambly brought this up a number of years ago on the Golf Channel on one of the telecasts, is that they work on such ideal control and, and positioning from a very early age or developmental age when somebody gets into into that sport. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Chinese do it as well in, in their powerlifting, and they've been phenomenal, of course, Yeah, uh, in, in that in the Olympics and the World Championships. But it's taking it from a very basic pattern, the pattern that should be – that you want at the end, they set the foundation for that very early on, and then they build on top of that. Yeah. And and it, in talking to you and, and Coach Gill and, and uh, the the GOATIS, knowing the GOATIS system or have an understanding of it, I, I won't say I know it. Uh, it seems like th if you have to build that foundation. That's why I asked you that question about kids or somebody being born a certain way or like a Michael Jordan uh, or somebody who becomes knock knee that that has to develop at some point. You aren't. I yeah. don't think you're just born like that because, as you showed, how kids come out of the womb, the 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 feet are somewhat crossed internally. Yeah, they're usually in that feet, they're they're inverted. So, yeah, that, that that's some very cool stuff. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. what uh, you know. What we, do you, okay. go ahead? I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, to interrupt. You're good. What do you see is is the the next thing coming in, in the fitness and slash golfing world that that that's going to have an impact this is obviously like is as coach gill like to say that there's waves of energy that we discussed it in in goda goda is already on the map like it's not going any away anytime soon because it does work that there whether and if somebody doesn't agree with that there are portions of it that work they have to at least admit to that yeah um I'm not smart enough and I'm not here to, to argue the virtues of one over the other or to, or to say go on this platform that's why I have a wide array of people and hence the name 360 That's right. uh, let people make their decisions and work with a practitioner and, and an app and whoever they want to and, and get their benefit let, let, let the people find out what works for them but what do you see as, as far as what might be the next thing in in the golf instructional or coaching and slash training world that that might have a, a big impact the same way that goda has now and, and some other things in the golfing world have Man, because you, you're you're one of the few that, that crosses the bridge between coaching and training. Yeah, you know, um, honestly, the, the with my dad being able to present a couple times in front of the BGA, I kind of think that goes the next thing coming into the golf world. Um, I, I think it, we haven't really had that opportunity to get in front of many golfers as much. Mm -hmm. uh, even even though you know Gary assessed, I think Bubba Watson. We we tried to talk to uh, Brooks Kepka a little bit. Um, so we've been in front of some people. Obviously, Noda's doing it. Noda's a big name in golf, um, but I don't think it's gotten to golfers. Uh, TPI has kind of taken over the golf fitness world. Being you know they've got eighty five thousand coaches worldwide. They're kind of every everywhere. Right. Um, so I, I think that next wave is going to be more geared towards, you know, how can we create a safe swing that's not going to get these guys hurt? You know, like what is the best way that we're going to be able to train this? Um, I think what most people are missing in golf is how important the walking pattern is. I mean, 90% of the round out there on the golf course is walking. That's, you know, we only hit 36 shots if we're good. <laughs> and at the most, we're trying to hit 36 shots. There's not a whole lot of golf going on on the golf course. It's a lot of walking, a lot of squatting, a lot of waiting around. So you have to know how to handle all of that. Like, what what are things I can be doing while I'm I'm waiting around on the tee for the next group to come up that's going to make me hit the ball better, help me walk better, help me move better? Um, so I think, you know, I do think that's going to be something big that's that's – Coming into golf, I think we're we're going to turn some heads and 
We're going to see how it goes. Hey, have you been working on trying to get uh, Dr. Greg Rose and Coach Gill and, and Dave Phillips and the two camps together to at least sit down and discuss some things? You know, I haven't, but I think that's a that is a good idea to get them get them at least to present and, and get to get to see it. I have thought about maybe getting together uh, the group to do a presentation, maybe at the PGA show. You know, they've always got the the stage there around TPI. I think that would be mm-hmm. a good place for us to get to some people. Um, so just trying to navigate the best way to, to do it without stepping on people's toes. You know, uh, golfers are kind of stubborn where if you turn them off once, they, they don't want to do it anymore. They're, they're already done. So, well, I've just, always said that, that the golf industry, the, the two, the best and the worst thing that it has going for it is tradition. And yeah. it, it's good that it keeps its traditions, but it's also could be an impediment in that it doesn't allow it to, to be malleable, to accept something that's on the periphery and, and could be very beneficial. Yeah, uh, something like this. Um, and t- I and I say TPI not only because you, you have a high, very high level of certification through them, but also because they, they seem to be I think they do a phenomenal job as a leader in identifying uh, things that are out there that will yeah. that will benefit other people. That, that yeah. That's I think uh, that I think they went to Dan Hellman for the Aldoa system and, and he, you know, he wrote that program for them. Uh, I think I don't I don't know the story. So, again the Twitter trolls or the social media trolls. I, 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 I'm obviously Phil Cheatham. Dr. Phil Cheatham was a phenomenal golf biomechanist. And I know that he does a lot of work with TBI. So they're obviously very good at identifying who is doing some great stuff and incorporating it or bringing it under their umbrella. Yeah. absolutely. Um, so I think that'd be cool if, if, if they, they in, in the go to system could somehow integrate and, and incorporate some of each to in the other system to everyone's benefit. Yeah, I mean, you'd love to see it all everybody come together towards a common goal of just creating safest, the safest, most efficient training possible, trying to prevent as much injury as possible. Like that's the end goal is just you know being able to work together towards the common goal of making everybody mm-hmm. better is, is what what we're trying to do. Outside of the, the the training aid, the true speed, do you have anything coming up? With like, you got a book coming out or anything? Are you going to be speaking anywhere that people can go check it out? Um, I don't have a book coming out yet, but, uh, we have the, you know, the, tem- uh, we have, we do have a seminar coming up in San Antonio. Uh, that's going to be November 11th through the 13th. We're going to have, uh, Ricky Stanzi and Gary Scheffler, the two master coaches from Gota down, um, uh, Friday night there, the 11th that river crossing golf club will be doing a, uh, a full go to seminar, kind of teaching everybody the system. Then mm-hmm. Saturday and Sunday, uh, we have some appointments for assessments that you can schedule. Uh, with Rick Gary and myself and kind of get yourself a starter program moving forward, kind of learn where you're missing, where you can improve uh, and get to, you know, figure out how to take that first step to feeling better. Is that through the the Texas PGA or is that through you guys just just at your school? Us individually. uh, They're Mm -hmm. November 11th through the 13th at River Crossing Golf Club. Uh, in Spring Branch, Texas, and then Re- registrations on your all's website. Registrations on the website, and I believe uh, if it, on my Instagram as well. You can always just you can, you'll see my number on there. You can call me and get a hold of me. I'm I'm pretty easy to reach. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, like I said before, I'll have all that stuff in the in the summary. Easy click. Anybody in that area or that wants to go there, be sure to check that out. What yeah. uh, what what else, did we miss anything that that, that I. That I should have should have asked you. I think we we nailed down quite. We we touched on quite a bit. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, with the go to stuff. I mean, you can go. I can sit here and talk for hours about it. It's it's really been, you know, with a lot of systems. I kind of you you learn everything, and then you're like, okay, well, what's else? What's left? Like, what else are we learning? With this, I just every time I find something, I I just go deeper and find something new. Like it just keeps getting more and more in depth. The further I get into go to the the more I'm trying to get myself back to that position, you know, I was one of those people who was told you're going to have to avoid squatting for the rest of your life. And I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? Like, I I can't squat ever again that, you know, that they were saying by the time I was 35, 40, I was going to have to have a spinal fusion. I was going to be cauterizing nerves next to remove pain. I had, Achilles and knee pain that was unexplained that, you know, I'd go into physical therapists and they'd just be like, oh, you know, it's just residual from your back. Uh, and then I go work with these go to guys and literally it just disappears. I, I woke mm-hmm. up one morning 
my T band, Achilles, knee pain, back pain was literally like, it's like it wasn't there. Uh, and then, you know, if you back off the training, you kind of get that more feed towards those bad patterns, that bad behavior starts to creep in. And that little voice, that go to voice will be like, hey, hey, you're getting a little pain. Like, you better go mm -hmm. do your groundwork. And as soon as you get back and do that decompression work again and get back on the ground and get back to trying to reset the system to go to, everything just starts to feel better. It's, it's like you're you're syncing up the system and it can start to move freely and heal itself. It's fascinating. <laughs> Anybody that doesn't think that a, a, a go to wall squat where you do the, the flow, so where the, where you're doing the out and then the in, that, yeah. that they that they're, they can just go up against a wall and rip out 100 reps, no, you, you're not going to do it. I, I mean, I, I thought I was in pretty good shape and I, I got to about 50 and that was a struggle. Well, and that's what's funny. Like we have linemen come in that can easily deadlift 400 pounds, like mm -hmm. back squatting hundreds of pounds, but they can't sit in the air chair on the wall for more than 10 seconds without being like, dude, I'm gas. And that's where that question of like, well, what is strong? Like that guy can pick up a bunch of weight, but if he goes to load pressure on the balls of his feet for more than 10 seconds, he's touched. Like... I'd rather be strong and be able to have that guy be able to run like a truck through somebody on the balls of his feet and not get hurt than to have him be able to pick up his other lineman off the ground after he got beat. I'll tell you the other one that, that gets me is coach Gill has sent me the slant boards. Yeah. And, and, and to do the, the, I, I'll call it for lack of knowing and, and education at the, the uh, one legged uh, deadlift movement. No, the single leg air chair. So, so, yes. So where you're kind of going down and, and you know, the, the, the rear leg goes out and away as you yep. kind of put the head over the column. Oh, yeah. And my God, does the outside of my rear end light up? Yeah. I, I can't, I, I can get to, you know, he says, well, get, get to, if you can do a hundred reps, you'll be good. I can't even get to 50 in one. I got to do two sets of 25. Exactly. And, and you know, because it just gets so tight and tired. I'm like, my God. The thing I get most with the go to stuff is like, I, I had a kid that's a high school kid that came to me the other day and was like, coach, I'm feeling great. Just had to let you know, though, I had to take some breaks the first couple of times because I've never done anything like this. This is crazy. Like the what it does to your nervous system is like. It's harder work than anything I've ever done because it's it's parts of your body that you haven't turned on and haven't been using. Now, all of a sudden, you're asking them to just go 110%. Mm -hmm. It's taxing. It, it's exhausting. And, and I, you know, Coach Gill had connected me to Eric Goodman. And, and when I did his that 12-minute stretch session, that, that his original founder, uh, mm -hmm. it, I, I couldn't get to three minutes of it the first time I did it. My low back was just lit up for yeah. so, so bad. And it took me a week, through three to four attempts. And by the time I did, though, it was like 50% of the pain was gone immediately. Yeah, absolutely. It's, inc it's like, incredible. And I would say, you know, for anybody looking to try this stuff out, if you want to do it at home, we do have a website called recode225.com which Gary's kind of put together this program that changes every week, covers a lot of the basic movements, goes into more of the strength and conditioning realm. I would say if you, if you have any hesitation about GOTA at all, go try one month of that and give it a few workouts. And you see for yourself how challenging this stuff really is when you get down to it and how much it does improve the way that you feel and the way that you move. Yeah, and I, I've got my mom doing the – the at least walking with the the uh heal away because yeah, yeah she, she she went in for some yeah she she she's been going in for some rehab on her Achilles and they say you have some micro tearing and she's gotten my mom's I'm not going to say her age to be a gentleman <laughs> but I mean I'm I, if I'll put it this way I turn fifty tomorrow so someone can kind of figure out how old my mom is but her 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 feet have really gotten pointed out and her she is collapsing her arch is starting to collapse and I told her I said that the strain that you're putting on your Achilles and your soft tissue you know, uh, riding up your leg is causing you problem and you can go do rehab all you want to, but until you change your walking pattern, yeah. it's not going to get any better. Absolutely. I mean, for a lot of people, you know, a lot of golfers, they don't want to go to the gym. So simply just resting and getting them to rest, stand and walk better for them is life changing because now mm -hmm. they can go out and walk 18 holes and not have pain at the end of it. Like just doing those things of, being conscious throughout the day of, okay, I need to keep my feet straight when I walk. 
when I'm standing at a counter. So you'll see a lot of people when they stand at a counter, a best way to check this are your hips pressed against the counter. Most people's are going to be pressed against the counter. If you just simply back your butt up away from that counter with your feet straight and about fist width a distance apart, that's what we're looking for in that decompressed spine. So just simply standing better, doing the dishes and cooking a little better at home and standing at the countertop a little differently and being conscious of, okay, I need to walk with my feet straight and I need to make sure when I'm resting, I'm not resting in a horrible position. Those things can be, I mean, that can get, that can be all people need just to get through what they want to do and what they love to do, you know, just to go play golf more or enjoy, enjoy, enjoy life. Yeah, exactly. Enjoy So you're not in chronic pain. Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, that's our main goal is we want to keep people doing what they love for as long as possible. Cause that's, I mean, life's no fun if you can't do what you love to do. Exactly. Well, you want to do some emergency nine questions. We've got nine yeah. questions at the end and then we'll wrap up and we'll let you go. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Um, the, the first and the last one I, I give to everybody just to kind of keep some continuity to it. So, uh, and, and I think they're pretty cool questions. So the, if you were, let's see, we had the President's Cup last week. So if you were on the President's Cup team and you're walking up to the first tee and they're playing a song, what what song would you have them play? Ooh. Man, I mean, I have the Tigers a classic. And I'm hoping yeah, it's sitting right behind me while they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you walk into a casino. What's the first game you're playing? Um, sure. Probably Blackjack. Yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, out of the, all, all the odds that you games you can play, you got blackjack and roulette are the best yeah, odds for the player. They're going to be my two choices because I got good odds. You're right. <laughs> all the other ones, I, I don't even know how to play the others. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, if you could buy stock in any golfer over the next five years, who who are you buying stock in? Uh, do they have to be PGA or could they be LSC? No, it could be a, 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 any any professional golfer in the world. Um. Ooh, over the next five years, you know, I'm, I, I like what Rory's doing. I, I think he's going to push forward. I think his mentality is getting stronger. I think the, the push from the LIV guys leaving kind of lit a little fire under him. And I'm mm-hmm. ready to see what he does with his game over the next five years. Cause I think he's going to try to go after those majors now that a lot of those guys are gone. Yeah. I think with that, you hit that on the head. I, I predict Rory will have a very good year because at that level, those guys need to be inspired by something. I mean, there was nobody as good as Michael Jordan at taking the smallest thing and being inspired. Tiger was obviously except, exceptional at that as well. I think Rory has gone through a, a life cycle to where, I mean, he he, he was on a, a hell of a tear for a while. He got a lot of money to do it. Yeah, he's got, he he went through the period where he established his family. You know, he got married. He, he has uh, kids. And I, I think that that all those things are in place. And as you mentioned, the, the whole live thing has really got him focused and inspired to do some some big things i i think Rory's gonna have a big year next year yeah i absolutely. agree It'd be hard to bet against them that's for sure yeah definitely your favorite sports movie favorite sports movie uh i like 10 cup, <laughs> 10 cup <was> my favorite. <laughs> hard not hard to go against that one i've been there you know i've, I've been in that i've been the the guy flipping his hat around <laughs> best course you ever played uh, you know, I got to play Hill, uh, Bay Hill quite a bit while I was over at school in Orlando. Uh, and mm-hmm. that was really special getting to play there. Uh, I would say one of my favorites that I've ever played though, was a place called Paco Ridge out in New Mexico. Um, just a, a beautiful place, beautiful landscape and an extremely challenging golf course. And I, I really enjoyed that. I got to go with Braden, our other instructor over here, uh, back when mm-hmm. we were kids and, that was that was a special trip. That's cool. I always like to hear. Ever you know, a lot of people will go to the big ones, mm-hmm. uh, the Spyglass or Pebble or Bay Hill, Muirfield, Pine Valley, and it's always cool to hear that the courses that might not be on everyone's radar, and you know, people can go check them out and see what kind of cool, unique things and places to play are out there. So that that one, that's a cool one. Um, couple more. The most used app on your phone. I think I lost you. There. Yep. All right, I got you now. You froze on me for a second. Can you, are we good? Hey, we're good now. Uh, the most used app on your phone. 
Uh, it definitely Instagram, I would say. In- Instagram and my uh, and the on form app because I'm sitting there scrubbing videotape constantly. But Instagram, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually stealing videos from Instagram, re- taking the video and then going and scrubbing it. So it's kind of a combination of the two. <laughs> I think there would be a lot of people in that same boat on the Instagram part. Yeah. I, I've been getting on on that more. I, I, you know, we had the hurricane. It is, you know, we as you and I were texting back and forth and learning how to to what the hell that's all about. I mean, I was just posting pictures and I'd post audiograms of guests on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now with the reels and and you can add multiple videos and you can add the the text and it, it rolls through. I mean, to to me that that's a I guess my uh, my creative mind just is running in a million different directions. It might not yeah, be good for productivity, but it's been kind of fun. Yeah, it's not not the best for productivity, but it definitely it, it can inspire you a little bit. It can it can get you thinking. A mm-hmm. uh, couple more, uh, two doors. You get to pick one of them. One door number one, you get to erase all the mistakes you've ever made in your life, and door number two, you get ten million dollars in hand. Mm, I'm gonna go ten million dollars in hand because I don't think I'd be where I was today with you know, erasing all those mistakes. Right. And for $10 million, you could probably put a lot of your mistakes away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one, uh, everyone gets this one as well. In your opinion, uh, greatest golfer of all time could be men, women, could be anybody. Who, who do you think was the best ever or the greatest ever? You know, babe, Diedrich, Diedrichson Zaharius was pretty good back in the day. Uh, that was, that's impressive. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I always, I liked, so I, I got to watch Tiger during that 2000, 2001, 2002 stretch because my dad was right there teaching Noda. And that's really – nobody ever did it like he did. The way that he was able to walk in and, and own that entire crowd and be able to look guys in the eye and have them look down in a way and not even be able to look at him is, is something special as an athlete. I mean, just mm-hmm. that sheer intimidation factor, the – the winning mindset that he had, how hard he worked. I mean, I, that's something I don't think anybody's ever going to be able to match. It, it, it's somewhat, it's going to be, it's almost like it's a generational athlete. I mean, you had Jack would be, let's say would be in my dad's era. I would have, yeah. I think I'm three years older than Tiger. Um, Cause I, I remember uh, in, as a junior playing in the insurance classic, the big eye was a big national tournament back in the eighties. And, uh, I missed nationals the first year I tried to go buy a shot and the tournament director had to go out there cause he was pretty big in, in that company. And he came back and said, there was a 12 year old kid that had the lead the first two rounds. And then he faltered at the end. He said, his name's T- uh, Tiger Woods and he's from California. I'm like, well, that's an interesting name. And, and uh, yeah, he did a lot of interesting things later on, but that, that was pretty cool. I, I would was- say one we're going to have to watch for is Charlie. His son, uh, I don't know if you uh, obviously put up that 68 the other day and noticed tournament. Uh, mm-hmm. His hands and his feet are huge. He's, he's going to be an athlete. And if he can hold on to right now, he's got some really good movement patterns. If mm-hmm. he can kind of hold on to that and keep that good golf swing working, I think we're going to see some really special stuff out of him too. That'd be kind of cool. I, I, I hope that with Noda's influence, it may be uh, – Tiger could try some go to and, and see how that, I mean, he, his body is really beat up now. I mean, yeah, you know, God they, bless him. And they basically rebuilt his whole entire lower body. And, it, you know, I, I do hope that one day we're able to at least have the conversation of, you know, maybe if we try a couple of things, because I, I find it hard to believe to be in that they're best friends, that if Noda's down on the ground at Tiger's house, Sitting like this, <laughs> I'm sure Tiger's going to ask a couple of questions. Like, dude, what are you doing? So I, I don't think Noda being the guy that he is would ever have the success that he's had and not share at least the, the rocker portion or the indigenous. You know, some of the things that we showed him at Comos. I think he's probably shared a little bit of that with Tiger. Mm-hmm. But it's a question of you know how much really does he have left that he can do. And I think for that, that's where we really got to, we would have to sit down and have a team look at him from go to, to make sure that we give him everything we need. Yeah. Can, can he even get, get full extension of, of his ankle and yeah. that he, whole complex at this he point? He might not ever get that full range back, but we can at least get the structure accepting and loading and releasing energy proper, which mm-hmm. would be, you know, for him, at least give him some more years being able to walk and play with his kids and caddy. Yeah, that'd be good. That's the biggest thing for him now is, you know, 
for Gil, that was the hardest part and kind of the eye opener for him and why he needed all this stuff was he wasn't able to get down on the ground and play with his newborn. Uh, and that was the hardest thing in the world. That was kind of like missing a rite of passage for him. Uh, and for, for Tiger to have those injuries and potentially not be able to play with his grandkids or something is, uh, that's not something you ever want to see for somebody. So if we can at least give him that back, that would be, I mean, tremendous. That'd be pretty cool. Hunter, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on. It's, it's a lot of fun talking. I, I look forward to meeting you at some point. I got to get out there and talk to your dad about coming out there at some point and just watching him teach and uh, helping any way I can and, and yeah. hanging out there and just absorbing some more info. I'd love to send you over uh, Ricky Stanzi to do a podcast too, because I feel like he'd he'd get your mind working a little bit and have some cool things. L- I'd love to have him on. That that'd be kind of cool to have him on. I, I, I'm, always, I'm trying to get um, Andrew Jones. Uh, my brother works for PXG, and he and Andrew have gotten to be good friends. And then uh, uh, Mark Messier. I used to play a lot of golf with Mark when I was playing professionally, and he he was he had the year off of hockey when they were on strike, uh, so we used to play a lot of golf. So Mark's talked about coming on. So. Uh, be cool to have some some athletes outside who are, love golf and big golfers come on the show and just talk talk about the differences and the similarities. That that, that looking forward to the next month, few months, and and year being very interesting, cool guests. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, uh, I'll have this to you um, as soon as everything's uploaded and everything. And uh, do me a favor as, as I click off here. Let me just stop this, and I'll have the.